growing up, um, I was pretty good at sports, but I was also really heavy. I was overweight. In fact, in fact, growing up until I was around 16 or so, my nickname, so everyone calls us dupes, Dupuy is, and I, all my brothers were all called dupes. Everybody knows us as dupes in the community, but I was called Bubba Dupes. So much for taking the time to be here this morning. Well, thanks for having me, Lance. You <laughs> book? Yeah. That's, That's all right. Yeah, yeah. Did, did, um, is that your first book, or your only? Do you have other books as well? No, I actually, that's my first book, and it's interesting you ask me that because I'm in the process of writing my next two. They're both kind of, uh, let's say, left hand on one and right on the other. That's beautiful. Okay, well, let's start off with where were you born? So I'm from Windsor, Ontario. Okay. which is right across the border from Detroit. It's actually a little known fact. It's one of those nice trivia points that Windsor is south of Detroit. In other words, to go to the U.S., I have to drive north. It's the southernmost city in Canada. It's south of Detroit. Yeah, yeah. So Ontario kind of dips oh, down. down. That's right. And to go to Michigan, to go to Detroit, across the bridge or through the tunnel, you have to drive north. So I always tease my friends uh, from Michigan that I need to go up north to what Michigan. Are you doing so what were you like as a kid? Do you have a lot of siblings? I've got two brothers, so I'm the middle son. Uh, my older brother, who's a police officer, just retired in Windsor. My younger brother's a firefighter. How many years difference? Three years. <coughs> Excuse me. So we were, uh, yeah, we were, uh, let's say, a typical, you know, um, boy home in that we were all in sports. And being Canadian, we all played hockey. Hockey was our life in the winter. Baseball in the summers. Uh, yeah, really uh, active home. Right. Mom and dad? Yeah, dad, dad was a teacher, high school teacher. Um, what did he teach? He was he actually was the head of the religion department at Ontario's, southwestern Ontario's largest Catholic high school. So I grew up in quite a Catholic home. Uh, in spite of my name, very French-Canadian name, Dupuy, I actually don't speak French. My mother was from Italy, originally from Venice, and my dad was half French, half Italian. Okay. Hence the Dupuy name, but actually our home was quite Italian. So my, my mom was also a teacher, but then uh, she stopped working when she had her boys. Is that right? So your father, are your mother and father still? No, passed? they both passed away uh, during my time actually living in Japan. And, mm -hmm. and fortunately, I was able to be there with them. But yeah, they a very warm home. You said um, you were able to be with them? Yeah, I was able to be okay, back cool. with my parents, which is always a challenge when you're living abroad, Lance, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, in our community here, especially not only in Japan, but anyone who's an expat or living abroad, right. it's always that thing that pulls at you. But I was... Really fortunate to be able to get back. In. Were they, oh, how old were your parents? Were they both in their, yeah, both. Uh, father was mid 60s, mom was in the early 70s. When were she they passed at the same time? No, no, there was, oh, a, there was a gap there, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And who went first? My dad. Your dad uh, went my first. dad passed away first, yeah. And that, that was quite a moment, I think, um, you know, I'd, I'd say, especially when you talk about the father son relationship. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a tough moment in life, it's a real turning point. Mm -hmm. And you realize the uh, responsibility, and you also kind of get reminded of mortality when you lose your parents. And you had to be there with both. Yeah. Going yeah. through. That's interesting. Did your father serve in the service? No. Chance? No. No. Uh, but it, he served in a different way. If we talk about service mm -hmm. um, in the community, he was really uh, an active member in the community. He was a well known guy. And he wasn't well known because of any, let's say, political affiliation. It was just because he was a connector. Okay. He was a vivacious, outgoing fellow, um, and everybody knew my dad, and he was so proud of his family and, and uh, shared stories with you. He was a real, just a good connector, and I learned a lot of things from him. He was a real Italian. Yeah, in that way, you're right. He was. He was really Italian, yeah, yeah, and very optimistic. Was he? Full of energy, yeah. Well, that's good. Do you think he had a favorite among his sons? Well, that's a tough one. I would say my dad, no, he was pretty, I think he had uh, no favorites, but all three boys were his favorites. But the joke in my house is that I was always the favorite of my mom, as in being the middle child. You were? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My were you brothers, mom tight? Were you guys close? close? We were very close. And a very, very similar personality. I'd say my brother's more similar to my dad. Um, I was much, yeah, I was more similar to my mom in many ways. Okay, what kind of kid were you growing up? Were you more athletic or were you more academic? Well, here's the interesting thing. Growing up, um, I was pretty good at sports, but I was also really heavy. I was overweight. In fact, in fact, growing up until I was around 16 or so, my nickname, so everyone calls us dupes, Dupuy is, the, and all my brothers were all called dupes. Everybody knows us as dupes in the community. But I was called Bubba Dupes, because I was big. I was overweight. But somehow I was really good at sports. 
So was Wait, would that be from sticking with your mom a lot and her feeding you? I think so. Just taking I can, care of you? And probably. Probably the Italian influence was there. Um, yeah, I know I love to eat. You know, I still do. I, I've got a sweet tooth. But, but, you know, back in the day when we were growing up, there wasn't a lot of awareness of, uh, let's say, healthy eating and fitness and so on. It was more about outcomes. You know? I was a decent hockey player. But you think about it now. What if? Huh? What if you kind of thought about your health more carefully? You know, your eating habits, um, fitness and so on. Probably could have. Yeah, probably. Were your parents heavy level. set or were they? Yeah, yeah. Both yeah. of them were heavy set. Yeah, they were both. They were both heavy set as well. I'd say that's also, uh, you know, living on this side of the world, it's something you appreciate. And I'm sure you would feel it as well. Uh, you know that that um, when you live in Asia, particularly, eating habits tend to be healthier, and yeah, it's it's in a way easier to maintain a, a lifestyle where fitness is, is a key part of that. No, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm into fitness. Uh, I know like you as well, Lance, but I, I think fitness is, is not only about body, it's about mind. And it's so interconnected. And we, we learned that in the past few years, especially with true. COVID, the importance of health is not just physical, it's mental. Isn't it? Equally. Important. So tell me this, I, what did you gravitate towards? The academic part or were you really more, I'd rather play? Yeah, I, I absolutely would rather play. I got by in school uh, with a bit of effort and did okay. I did what was necessary. Um, but I think that's where I resemble my dad in many ways that I was uh, always really outgoing and you know I loved to love to you know make conversation and small talk even when I was a little kid, you know always would just approach people from sitting out front of the house on my tricycle. My mom said I would just go up to you know the mailman and have a chat and so on. So I was always kind of kind of outgoing that way. Um, in school, I did better in the subjects that were, I'd say, not related to science and math and so on, probably better. So in, do you have any that you remember really enjoying? Yeah, I really uh, enjoyed anything related to human stories. So English, English literature. Uh, in my high school in Windsor, we had a great course. It was human in society, basically the early roots of sociology, right? And you learned about, uh, yeah, you learned about uh, how language influences and impacts the people around you, how behavior impacts, how, how you create communities and so on. When I think back, that's actually probably where, partly where the roots of uh, my approach to leadership was born. Let me ask this one, but what was your teacher like for that class? Yeah, well, he just passed away recently. Um, and you see, you know that. I, so I know that. But that tells me that you kept in contact with him and he was probably very influential in your life and if I asked you how many teachers inspired you in your life, how many, how many inspired you? There are three that are absolutely top of mind. And let me tell you a story now that you bring that up and I haven't really shared this with many people. So I was back in Windsor a couple months ago and I told you earlier about, you know, this thing about you, you hit a certain stage in life, you think about mortality and you realize that at one point we are next in line and that's the circle of life, the natural circle of life. And I was going back to Windsor for a visit, especially after going through COVID and all the challenges that I've encountered, uh, we've all encountered, and certainly we'll talk later, I'm sure I was in India and in really tough times. Um, so I went back to Windsor on this trip and I thought, I'm gonna make this a theme. My trip is gonna be called the Gratitude Tour. So I hunted down those three teachers that impacted me heavily. And there was one teacher in particular uh, that I reached out to, it was my English teacher. And she was that, that um, tough but warm, strict but fair mom type. And in fact, we called her Ma, that was her nickname, right? And so I, I small town, everyone kind of knows everyone. I managed to get her contact info. So I gave her a call. Now I'm calling this teacher after not having seen her, spoken to her in probably 35 years. And I said, hey Ma, it's Paul Dupuy calling. And immediately she said, Paul, I thought you were in India. Somehow she knew about my travels. I said, well, actually I'm back in Japan for the fourth time. Oh my gosh, well, she's in her 80s now, sharp as a nail. And I said, mom, I'm coming back to Windsor and it would be great to get together for coffee. I'd love to see you. She said, great, let's do it. Fast forward, I got on the plane, I went to Windsor. We arranged to meet. I called her the day before just to you know, reconfirm. And she said, I'm so excited to see you. I don't know what to wear. And she said, by the way, I have to warn you, I've shrunk with old age. So she just had an amazing sense of humor, the same woman I knew. So I went to pick her up and she came out and she didn't, she hadn't changed a bit. She got a bit older, but still that power and that energy and that warmth and big hug. 
we got in the car, we drove a couple blocks down along the Detroit River, beautiful kind of port down there. We went out, sat out in a cafe. It was two o'clock. And I thought, we'll go and have a coffee and have a catch up, maybe an hour, hour and a half. I kid you not, it was seven o'clock in the evening and we were still talking. And she had stories to share. She was so inquisitive. Um, she started talking to me about deep issues in India around the, the separation with Pakistan and India. And she was talking about a book she read on the topic. She was so well She'd read. never been there. Never been. Wow. But so well read and aware. And she knew a lot about Japan. This is so inspiring. I thanked her for the impact she had on me and the lessons she taught me, both in the classroom and out. Um, and then I dropped her off at home, gave her a big hug and said goodbye. I continued on my journey, met a couple more teachers, a similar kind of stories. And then I got on the plane and I was making my way to Singapore from uh, Canada through the States to um, uh, an APAC regional leadership team meeting. And I got the sad news that she was in the hospital. She had fallen and she was in a coma. And two days later, she passed away. And then something happened. I got several emails from friends and family members uh, of, of Ma saying that, Paul, after you met her on that afternoon for coffee, she sent us all emails, long emails, talking about your conversation and how she, proud she was of you. And that was the last email that they all received from her. And I thought, first of all, I'm so lucky to have seen her, uh, the ma that I knew, the vivacious, energetic, warm, loving teacher that impacted me so much. And I was also really grateful that I was able to go and look her in the eyes and say thank you. So I encourage everybody to you know, go on a grateful tour once, push pause and, and look back and go say thank you to those people that have helped you along your journey. There was another teacher who, uh, who I saw and his wife as well. My parents were good friends with them. And so I went and saw them as well and, and the same thing. And this is also a teacher who helped me through that final year of high school. You talked earlier about, did you do well in school? I just got by. I was student council president in my last uh, year in high school. So that means you were involved to be able to I was in, in the student community. body. Yeah, I was active. Was it a big school? Or was yeah, it about 2000. A Catholic school. Catholic school. All 2000. Boys. No, no, no. Oh, it oh, was co ed. Co ed, yeah. Co ed. Okay. 2000 plus. Big school by, let's say, Canadian That's uh, a big school. Catholic school standards. Um, yeah, and so this teacher was actually my counselor, my academic advisor, as well as my business accounting finance teacher. So it was a business accounting course. And I wasn't doing so well in that. I mentioned earlier, it wasn't my strength. Although ironically now, as the CEO of a large corporation, I uh, actually, I know my numbers and it's important that I know it. But, uh, but anyway, so I went to see him and, and he said, you know, Paul, at this pace, you're not gonna get into university with this average. Here's what you need to do. And he laid it out for me. And I remember that was quite a shocking moment. I just assumed I would, uh, you know, make do and you know glide through and get into university and live happily ever after it was a wake-up call and he helped me come up with a strategy to get there and if he hadn't uh, brought me in his office and, and been proactive and triggered that and put that on the table I me mean, I probably wouldn't have been able to get into university and that would have put me on a completely different path in life so I went and saw him it was great to catch up and uh, you know as energetic as always and uh, he's also very aware of of my journey, which I found really inspiring that these teachers who I look up to, that I respect, they've been kind of watching and observing curiously and in his words, living vicariously through me. So I, I found that to be, uh, yeah, it was, it was a nice moment. That's interesting. I'm just thinking of your, the difference between your country and the mm -hmm. one that I'm from, America, mm -hmm. where we, we tend to be a little more individualistic. I am, I am me. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you came from a we type of environment where everybody was intertwined and they were closer. That's the feeling I get. Yeah, and, and that's an interesting observation. I, and I don't know if it's Canadian or American. I mean, there's clearly right, a difference between the cultures. Right. Uh, but I would say the culture of Windsor, Ontario, the culture of my community and my home, absolutely, and, and school and so on. And so church was a part of our life as well. Um, 
it was all about community and so being connected and I think you're right you know I probably used we a lot more than me and I growing up mm -hmm. by the way that connects today fast forward to 2022 it connects with my own approach to leadership now that's right very aware of the, of the power of we and us right. especially I'm, in a Japan context just to, to go a little further ahead I'm listening to your book now I oh, have it on audio thank you yeah. listen to it I love motivational books especially when they're about leadership which yours is good. Just through the first part, I could tell it was going to be good, and I'm enjoying what I'm hearing because a lot of it. My uncle used to tell me there's no such thing as common sense because <laughs> all of us live different lives. Yeah, there's yeah. nothing common about that. Mm -hmm. So you have to. Um, I think it's common to leaders. People that mm -hmm. have been in those positions mm -hmm. will find a lot of the information in your book to be very telling and very useful to continue their journey. And I like the part where you get out of your comfort zone to see what it's like to be in a whole different environment and what your leadership now, like now, you know? And yeah, you can't yeah. do it alone. You have to have those people to try Absolutely. Them. When you were in college, you mm -hmm. spent four years through college? Yeah. What did yeah. you study? University of Windsor. Uh, it was a liberal arts degree. Again, I would say carrying on the theme, huh? I was playing to my uh, track record, my baseball card, eh? which said that I'm just gonna kind of get through, and it was the liberal arts, it was history and sociology. And Did so you on. do any sports in college? Uh, I, you know, I played hockey uh, outside of the school, not, not on the school team, okay. uh, but I played hockey actively, and then I really got into the martial arts. And that's, that was a turning point for me. That was really when I got fit. What brand? Uh, I started off doing, you know, in North America, it's always a mishmash, right? Okay. Uh, but it was really kind of a, a, it was Kung Fu, it was Chinese Kung okay. Fu, uh, with some Jiu Jitsu mixed in, a bit of self-defense and so on. But I just loved everything about it, and, and I, I got hooked. And then, of course, that was in the era of, you think about the movies back then, of course, Bruce Lee, that was before then, but I was watching Bruce Lee movies, and I thought, started to kind of get interested in Asia, and then Jean-Claude Van Damme, that was his era. We're talking about the 80s. And I thought, you know, when, when he was traveling off to Hong Kong and Thailand, these places are amazing. I have to go there one day. And I didn't know where there would be. So you're 19, 18, 19? 18, 19, 19 20, 20, yeah. 20, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that you, you, had, you, had you traveled at all prior to that? Not at all. I didn't have a passport. I was a born and raised Windsor boy. <laughs> I think the furthest I might have been in Toronto once, but you know, of course, to Detroit. And, you, know, you went up to Detroit. Right? I went. I went north to Detroit, and, <laughs> and the joke is that the best thing about Windsor is Detroit because as a hockey fan, I've got my Red Wings there, and I watch them win Stanley Cups. Of course, the Pistons and the Tigers, the Lions, and so on. Huge Michigan Wolverines fans. We have uh, we have season tickets to this day, more than fifty years. Yeah. So well, who you and you just you family. and your family family. Yeah. You and your brothers? My dad started this thing and, and it's always this question, why would you he didn't go to Michigan, but he was a huge football fan. And I think in hindsight, when I think about it now as a dad, he was creating an opportunity to spend time with his boys. And by getting seasons tickets to Michigan football, and you know college football in the US, there's nothing compares to it. It starts with a tailgate in the morning, right? You arrive at eight, nine o'clock, you pack up your car, your van, you bring all your food and drinks. And then in Michigan, what they would do is they would rope off the golf course next to Michigan, the, the big stadium, the big house, and you would park there. And then on the fairways, they would have pick up football games. So you just show up and play football with whoever's there, tag football kind of thing. So then, you know, that becomes a community as well. Because every Saturday when you go, you get to know everybody. And it's friendships built in this. Uh, so growing up, in a way, I kind of grew up around Ann Arbor. And uh, yeah, we still have the tickets. My brothers still have them. They're doing the same thing with their families. Whenever I can go back with my, my boys and my wife, we give them that experience as well. So, yeah. Well, that is beautiful. That's beautiful. So anyway, so through college, yeah. you, 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 just, you basically were just liberal arts. Liberal arts. Did oh, you? But yeah. I was going to ask you this about this part came to mind. When you were a kid, did you ever have dreams of leaving Canada to go somewhere else? Did you have that desire? Not somewhere? at all. Not at all. You, you I, saw you, so you could see your journey. Because most of us think about, okay, when I get older, I'm going to be like yeah. my dad or whatever. Is that right. what you saw? Right. Well, you, you talk to a lot of people, especially raised in smaller towns. They mm -hmm. just want to get out. And I would say, not at all. Windsor's a wonderful town. It's a, I'll say this with all respect, it's a lunch bucket town. It's a blue collar town. It's, in a way, it's the Detroit of Canada. The big three automakers are all there. In fact, I worked at Chrysler for five years as a welder through university, uh, part-time, three days a week. That's how I paid my way through university uh, and learned some amazing lessons there, of course. 
But you know, I never had a desire to leave. In fact, that's kind of that, that one mysterious question is warm, loving home, nice community, I knew everybody, and my friendship, my network, everything was there. Why leave? But I always had this innate curiosity about the world. And I would say, again, it probably was triggered by my interest in the martial arts. That was the first... Van Damme's the one that got you to That was the first reason to get on the plane, yeah, yeah. You saw yourself in him, you said, oh, man. Well, yeah, I mean, he was, he was the ultimate definition of cool in the 80s, right? Um, but, you know, I remember, Lance, I'll never forget. So it was 1989, and it was getting close to graduating from University of Windsor, thinking about my life ahead. And I knew I wanted to go to Asia just to experience it. There's something called a working holiday visa that uh, Canada has with a number of countries. A lot of Commonwealth countries would have it. And Canada and Japan had this relationship where you could show up in Japan with no job, but you'd have a six-month visa that would allow you to work. Okay? And vice versa, Canadian and Japanese can go to Japan. So I heard about that. So I went to the public library. Back in the day when there was no internet, if you wanted information, you went to the library. If you didn't know the Clark catalog, you couldn't get anything. You know? I went up to the kind lady behind the counter at the Windsor Public Library downtown, and I said, can you point me in the direction of the Asia section? And she looked at me with this kind of you know, quizzical look in her eyes, saying, Asia? Let me look that up. And she flipped through the car. She said, it's on the fourth floor, back corner. It's on okay. So up to the fourth floor. I went, back corner, sure enough, top shelf. There were books on Asia, and they were... Lonely Planet guidebooks, you know, those touring guide, you know, for yeah, tourists. So I pulled one off on Japan, uh, Taiwan, Korea, and so on. And I remember sitting down, and I opened up the Japan book, big, thick, lonely planet. I opened up, and the dust flying off the book. Probably nobody had ever opened up this book before. And I was flipping through the pages and learning about Japan. I knew nothing about Japan. Uh, and I saw Hokkaido, kind of like Canada. You know, mountain is cold in the winter snow. I saw. Okinawa, really interesting. Uh, tropical, American military, heavy presence. Uh, learning a little bit about the history, didn't know much about that. Tokyo, um, you know, fashionable, the center of politics, um, international, expensive, busy. Then I came across a page on Osaka. And it was a photo of Dotonbori Bridge in Osaka, which is right down in the main downtown of Osaka. And there's a famous neon sign there of the Glico man, the Glico convection. He's got his arms up, right? He's a, he's a track athlete, right? And I saw that, and then underneath that photo it said, people in Osaka are merchants. It's a merchant town historically. They love, to, they love their food, they love their sports, they love to laugh, they're warm-hearted and they speak their mind. And I said, I'm going there. I closed that book, back on the shelf, drove to the travel agent back in the day when you buy a ticket from a travel agent. Remember you get the book of tickets, you know, the pink and yellow. Yes, yes. And I said to the lady, I'd like a ticket to Osaka. And again, she looked at me, Osaka. And now you're out of college now. I'm about to Wait, graduate. You're about to graduate. Getting ready to graduate. Yeah. And I said, I'm going to Osaka. So I bought the ticket. So I took my life savings. Um, I sold my car, bought the ticket with this, the proceeds from the car. And I took my life savings. I had about 25,000 yen left after I bought a suit, my backpack, and everything I needed to go. What about your discussion with mom and dad? Oh, yeah, mom and dad knew that, uh, the, you know, I was the, uh, the middle child. So I was always going to often do something. Because as long as the oldest and the young, yeah. Yeah, no, the, middle, gotcha. the middle child senior. Has more love. Yeah. I had planted the seeds that I was going to go right. somewhere. And they, were, and they were fine. They were fine. They, in fact, they encouraged me. Little did they know or I know that it would be a lifetime adventure. So off I went to Osaka. My first day in Osaka in now September. You're, what, how old are you? 20, 22. 22, okay. And nowhere to stay. Didn't know anybody. Didn't speak a word of Japanese. Had never seen a Japanese person. Literally knew nothing. You had never seen a Japanese no, person? I mean, growing up in Windsor, I'd never, never encountered a, a, a Japanese person. Okay. So. Um, and I had nowhere to stay. So I slept on a park bench in uh, Osaka, which back in the day, anyone who knows Osaka will know this area called Tennoji, Dobutsen Mai, Nishinari. It was kind of considered the, the slum of Osaka. And that's where I began, with my, uh, my big red backpack with that Canadian flag sewn on by my godmother. She sewed it on there for me before I left. And that was my pillow, and that's where the Japan adventure began. My goodness. So how long did you stay from that time? That time turned from six months to five years. Did you so meet was, your Did you meet your present wife within I, that time? I met a girl, and 
you know what happens. You know? Well, how long were you here before you met the girl? Uh, actually, shortly after I arrived, yeah, I'd met her, and we were friends, of course. I was, you know, I was into Japan. I was into karate. My whole life was, you know, I found that. You dojo. changed from kung fu to karate. Yeah, I came okay. to Japan. I thought I would um, do something traditional, and so I found a dojo that was uh, was Goju Ryu Karate Do. Go is hard, and Ju is soft, right? The hard and so the original, let's say Okinawan karate. Uh, and I absolutely loved it. And I also did Aikido as well. Um, so I trained pretty well every night. And, and that's where I learned Japanese, by ear. So I actually, you know, one word at a time. And uh, yeah, and again, community, the power of community. Tell me this, did you, so had you gotten lean by that time already? Yeah. You're, yeah. So you did that while you were in college? I did that, I did martial oh, arts. It wasn't so karate, but it was, you know, it was martial arts. So I had, yeah, I had a background in, you know, in martial arts. And you, you met your wife within, what, a year of being here? Yeah. And you guys dated? How long was that? How yeah, we dated for quite some time. Actually, we dated for, uh, oh gosh, a few years before we got married. Yeah. You were the parents good? Yeah, yeah, they were great. In fact, uh, the funny story there is when I actually met her parents. So she's the youngest of five kids. And her, uh, her father said, you know, she's my young, she's my baby. I want you guys to live near us. How many boys, how many girls in her family? Three, three uh, so four girls, one son. So she's the youngest daughter. And the son's where in there? He's the old, second oldest. Second oldest, wow. Yeah, yeah. So he wanted her to stay there, the others were gone. Well, you know, they had married and gone on living around in the area. They were all in Kansai. Okay. Uh, but anyway, he wanted his daughter nearby. And uh, so I jokingly said, it was a very tense moment as I'm asking for permission to daughter in a very tense moment. I said, oh, okay, well, then we'll live with you, jokingly. And he said, great, done. And you did. We did. We lived together for 10 years. <laughs> and I think about it now, it's funny, but it was the best thing we ever did because we ended up, of course, having our first son, living with grandma and grandpa, wonderful for the kids, for us as well. Grandpa passed away while we were together. So, you know, there was sadness, but then the baby arrives and that brought joy into the home. And then grandma was part of our lives. So both of my boys were very lucky uh, to grow up with grandma nearby. Mm -hmm. And you know, once I see it, and, and you, can, you can really see um, folks who have grown up around grandparents, they have a certain perspective on the world. They have a warmth that I think comes from that influence. And my boys were very fortunate, I'm fortunate, you know, we had that. Are your sons still here? Time. Yeah, uh, well, actually, my older boy's here in Tokyo. So he's had quite a journey. Huh? He uh, was with us when we lived in Singapore for a time. Uh, then we sent him on a summer program to Hawaii Preparatory Academy on the Big Island. A Canadian boy, born in Japan, a mom from Japan, and he wanted to go on this summer program. Went, okay, we'll send him on this summer experience. He came back. He said, Dad, I love this school. I want to go there full time. And of course, I thought you're you're nuts, you know. You're, you're yeah. First of all, with you know, with whose money? That's one big question you would ask. But uh, it just was never on the roadmap in my mind for my son to go off to Hawaii to high school. Uh, but we made a deal, and the deal was simple. A deal that I didn't think he was going to be able to deliver on, but he ended up delivering. So you get all A's this year in school, and I'll send you the senior year. Yeah, and this is a kid who never got all. So to all the uh, parents out there, be careful when you make a deal with your kids. I about made something deal. they want, especially and about something wanted. they want. And by the way, I'm so glad he did. And he did. Yeah. And we sent him to HPA on the Big Island. I also got to visit him. He played football there. He was captain of the school lacrosse Is he big? Team. Is he big like your family? He's, he's uh, let's say he's, uh, he's well built. Yeah, okay. he's in good shape, fit. Uh, but he was captain of his lacrosse team uh, at, at HPA. It's a bit of the Canadiana in Hawaii, which I found kind of, kind of funny. Uh, so he went there, and then now he's back in Tokyo working full-time. But he went to University of Victoria on the west coast of Canada, studied business, and he's here now. Absolutely bilingual, global citizen. And I think about, you know, the version of him compared to when I was his age and what a different life he's had, but so much convergence, too. What, what, were you, what was your job during the time he was in school? What were you doing then? Yeah, so I was in, uh, at that point, when I was in Singapore, I was head of a subsidiary of N Japan. N Japan is uh, Japan's largest job portal, job site, it's listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. They had acquired a company I had been working for before, Wall Street Associates, which was a recruitment company. Uh, and they asked me to stay on and lead the global expansion. So I moved to Singapore, started up the operations there. It's now called N World. 
Uh, and then I was also looking at M&A opportunities across Asia. So name the Asian country, I probably traveled there to investigate M&A opportunities. Uh, and then back to Japan, and I joined Randstad. That was the first time I was in Japan with Randstad, 2013 to 17, as one of three managing directors. Your wife ever worked? Uh, she worked with the family. They had family businesses, but they had restaurants and so okay. on. Yeah, but no, she's you know mainly been focusing on, on, on raising the family, on your family. Yeah, yeah that's and so that's a full time job. As so, about your second son? Is he here? He's not. Yeah. Here. So my second son is actually in Canada right now. He's in university in Ottawa, Canada's capital, Carleton University, and he's doing great. He's also just like his older brother, you know, a global citizen. He has the extra added, let's say, experience that his older brother didn't have. He lived with us in India for four years. His older brother was school. already off. He was already off in How Canada. How many years different between the two? Four years. Oh, four years, okay. So exactly, you know, when we moved to India, my older boy was off to university in Canada. So my younger boy was with us in India and he, he did his high school in Bangalore in South India at an international school. Does he speak one of the Indian languages? I have a few words, but no, okay. he's Japanese and English. Yeah. All right, but he does his Japanese and he has the English. Well, that's good, that's good. So he's, in school now. Yeah, he's in uh, okay. second year university in, in Canada. Canada. Yeah. Wow. So where are you now in your life? Because you've gone through all the places you've been basically, and then now you're back in Japan. When did you come back? This time? So this is the fourth time in Japan. I've circled fourth back, and this I came back uh, last April during the height of COVID, especially in India, if you recall, that's Delta, when Delta mm -hmm. the variant was really hitting India hard. It was such a tough time. And that, in a way, was also a turning point, I would say, in my life. Really taught me uh, the importance of life, of health, um, and of community. And I would say one more thing. I, I saw compassion in action. And the importance of being a leader who is compassionate. Not just feeling. Empathy is about feeling. Give me, Give me some examples. Give me some examples that you saw. So we had, we had 75 offices across the country. Uh, 1,500 core full-time employees, 65,000 temporary contractual workers, all working for Randstad. Yeah. And as the captain of the ship, I need to do my best to make sure people were safe. And that was a real challenge during COVID because if you recall in the news, um, basically the country ran out of oxygen. Hospitals were out of oxygen. People were suffocating. And Delta was, was, uh, was really, it was fierce. And it went after the lungs. So, you know, a really sad story is that we had over 150 people die in our organization from COVID, from Delta. And I was sitting in Bangor, again, as the captain of the ship, trying to keep the ship steady, trying to keep people encouraged and so on. And there was a moment there where I realized that, you know, just showing empathy to people when they were struggling was not enough. There needed to be action. And so we realized that people needed oxygen, and that was priority one, mission critical. Uh, boring a page out of the military approach. You leverage your contacts and you create that SWAT team and you make it happen, right? And the first thing was to find out who makes these oxygen concentrators that are used in all the portable ones. It's a company in the Netherlands. We happen to be a Dutch company, Dutch company, Philips. So we connected directly with the CEO of Philips, had a call, and interestingly, he had said, well, actually, we just had a request from the Prime Minister of India by Mr. Modi for a huge shipment of these oxygen concentrators. We can't keep up. Our manufacturing facilities around the world just cannot keep up, but I can help you dig up some units. And it ended up being 150 of these Philips units of these uh, oxygen concentrators that could save lives. Next is how do we get them there? Called up KLM, Dutch Connection, community. KLM, we need your help. They jumped in and they supported to send these, to expedite these machines. Next in this supply chain, back to the SWAT team. When they arrive in India, they need to get through customs. So we went down, we met the commissioner of customs. Now India is a different place right, to get things done. Uh, it's about connections, but it's also about incentives. Or well, we, don't, we don't play that game. So we explained the situation and they agreed to expedite processing these units. Within three days, we had 150 units in India and then my team on the ground our supply chain team, our procurement team, picked these things up and brought them directly to the homes of our colleagues across the country. And we literally saved lives. You know, and that was the revelation of the, the, the role of the leader, especially in times of crisis, not just to feel, but to do, right. to do, to take action.
and credit to the team, huh? the team that stepped up and made it happen. Because you know, it's one thing to have the idea and to do, be the connector, to make those phone calls and so on, but to be on the ground and do the tactical piece of this, which is really where the impact comes, is, uh, was remarkable. Did you always want to write a book? Had you ever thought about it? No, was I never. Somebody, who's, who, who spurred the idea and got you off your tuition to decide that I'm gonna go ahead and put pen to paper and make this happen? You got prompted. Um, Another lesson, huh? when, uh, when, when someone you respect makes a suggestion, you know, think about it. So it was actually right here at the Tokyo American Club, believe it or not. I was having dinner. I was back from India visiting at Christmas. And I had dinner with a very famous Japanese author. His name is Ken Honda. Honda Ken. He's written over 100 books. Very well-known guy. And I've known him for a few years. And we were having dinner. And he said, we're chatting about my journey. And so I said, you know, Paul, you need to write a book. And it was the first time in my life anybody had said that to me. That, Period. That's it. He said, you need to write a book. I said, ah, Ken, I'm not a writer. My first reaction, I'm not a writer. You know, I'm, I'm a CEO of an I'm not a writer. No, no, Paul, that's not the point. You have a story to tell, and you need to share your story. I said, okay, well, thanks, Ken. And then kind of, you know, left that dinner, and it was on my mind, but I hadn't thought about it. A couple of days later, I came across a quote from Richard Branson that said, if you've lived an interesting life, it's your duty to share your story with the world. Write a book. And I thought, wow, okay, that's two. <laughs> and then I was at London Business School doing some executive training on transformative leadership. They assign you a coach. And the coach asked me, Paul, let's talk about your philosophy of leadership. What is your approach to me? What are your beliefs? And I, I opened up the floodgates with my ideas on leadership. Anyone who's led has their ideas around leadership. And he stopped. He said, stop. You need to write a book. So that was the trifecta. So I put pen to paper. Now, it's not that easy, Lance, to write a book. Have you written a book? I have, my, I have two children books. Then you know. Yeah. It's not something you decide, you wake up in the morning, I'm going to write a book. It's not. That's the romantic version of writing a book. The reality is this. I thought, okay, I'm going to write a book. So I made a deal with my wife, living in Bangalore, right? Saturday morning, from 8 to 10 a.m., I'm going to sit out on our balcony overlooking Bangalore and with a coffee and some dark chocolate to fuel the creativity, I'm going to start writing this book, but I need to block Saturday mornings from 8 to 10. You need to have that discipline to do it. And I heard from others, you really need to dedicate the time, right? Like anything. So day one, I'm all excited. Coffee, chocolate, laptop, here we go. I know I'm going to write about leadership. So I started typing. And then backspace, backspace, back, delete, delete, delete. And I start. And backspace, delete. After two hours, I had a blank page. And then I realized, reality said, it's not easy to write a book. So I went to, where do you get your answers? I went to Google. How to write a book. And there are so many websites and YouTube videos, and that only confused me further because there's not really one methodology. So, you know, I was, I was thinking, how am I going to do this? And then I had a revelation. I thought, hang on a second. I want to write about leadership. I love to talk about leadership. I was doing a lot of speaking about leadership in different forums. Of course, as a leader, you're constantly talking with your colleagues. And I thought, why don't I record myself talking about leadership and turn those recordings into a book? So I took out my phone, activated voice memos, same spot, Saturday mornings out on the balcony, and I recorded about 100 mini clips where I shared stories related to leadership and my thoughts on leadership. Those clips became the core of the book. And from that, I wrote the book. Well, you, but you know, as a fellow author, you know, it's not an easy um, no. task, but it, it's such a great learning journey to write a book. It makes you reflect. Um, it makes you rethink. You realize the importance of language of the words we use, and I'll take it back in the leadership framework. You know, language creates culture, and that affects behavior, and ultimately culture is about behavior, right? So the connection between the language we use and the behavior, and of course outcomes, the execution is, is so important, and writing the book really kind of brought that home to me. That's wonderful, yeah. that's wonderful. So you have another book in plan? I actually have two on the go right now, but there's two, one two that's... The, two? Yeah, 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 I'm kind of flip-flopping back and forth, but one is, um, Let's say one is the front runner. And without kind of revealing too much about it, 
it's not a book on leadership. It's, uh, it's a book of small stories, we'll call them vignettes, that have a message, a really important message. And it's based in this notion of empty your cup. Bruce Lee talked about the best way to learn, to grow, to take on new skills and so on, is one cup at a time. Mm -hmm. Every day you show up with an empty cup. It's that Shoshin mind, right? The beginner's mind. And so I'm, yeah, I'm working on that one. It's coming along pretty well. Yeah. That sounds like a great yeah. idea too, Paul, because our gen generations are being taught to be very short-minded. Their attention span is very short now with TikTok and yeah. some of these, these clips they have now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can watch and see how fast people go from one thing to the next. So vignettes, I think, would be perfect. And especially, they used to have, um, Bits and pieces. Do you remember those little books? Oh yeah, sure, sure. I see, and they always yeah. had little quotes in there. Yeah, I love that. And I don't know why they're saying this is stuff that's it's happening now. We've always had it. That's true. That's what true. poems are about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> short to the point, giving you a story and giving you something that you can work with. And and something I in my book I talk about golden nuggets, right? You mm -hmm. know, every chapter finishes with some golden nuggets. And and in, and when I wrote the book, I wanted to. Do it in a way that if someone picked up the book and they didn't, they weren't readers and they didn't want to read the whole thing, they could just flip to the back page of each chapter and look at the golden nuggets. And and you know, people have shared with me that that actually they, they like that and that you know it, it's uh, those those simple takeaways are effective. But you you had that in your first book. Yeah, yeah. Every chapter ends with golden nuggets. Yeah. So what do you do on the audio tape? tape? I, on the audio, the audio book that audio I recorded, book, yes. which was another amazing adventure. Because you're the one, you're the voice behind Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, well, let me tell you that story, and then I'll tell you about the Golden Nuggets. So, so I was in Bangalore in the midst of COVID, the worst time, very stressful, as I told you earlier. I was sort of, you know, just, you know, scrambling to try to help and to keep the ship on course and to keep our people safe. At the same time, you realize as a leader, it's equally important that you take care of yourself, physically and mentally. If you're going to lead during times of crisis, you have to be in tip-top shape from A to Z, mentally and physically. So, of course, I was exercising. I was doing my morning walk. I still do that, 10,000 steps every morning. I'm in the 5 a.m. club. I'm up at 5, and I do that, and that's the discipline part. But also creating a, a mindset of positivity can do. But then I realized, okay, my book, it's been released. It's, it's actually doing quite well. But I thought, you know, I was getting asked by a lot of people, when's the audio book coming out? And I, I hadn't really, I'd never listened to an audiobook. And I didn't realize that a lot of people prefer audiobooks more and more. In fact, more than 30% of all books sold right now on Amazon are actually the audiobook format. And that needle is moving more and more in the audiobook direction. I was really pleased and happy to see your book was there because that's I love audiobooks. Interesting. Yeah, but I, I love regular books too, but they take up so much space. That we're becoming minimal, minimalist. And people, why have it when you have a phone that, is it really a phone? It's a camera. It's yeah, a yeah. scanner. It's, it's your library. It takes everything. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? And I didn't know that existed. So I knew yes. there were audio. So I got prompted again by a few people. You should write the audio book. Or sorry, record the audio book. I said, okay, good. So I defaulted to, well, I need to find a narrator. I need to find a professional voice actor or someone that would actually do this because there are you know, people that do this for a living. So I, I went on all the sites and I got connected to some and I saw what the costs were and all this and so my publisher had introduced me. Oh, okay. Then somebody, actually one of my team members in Randstad, India said, Paul, this book is your story. You need to tell the story. You should do it. And it was hallelujah moment. Uh, again, right. back to, I'm not a voice actor. I'm not, yeah. But then you realize, well, actually, it makes sense, doesn't it? Because it, it's in the first person. When I write, wrote the book, I, I mean, it's a discussion or a conversation with the reader. And so I decided to go for it. Here's the interesting thing. My team found a studio that had never done an audio before, but it was a music studio. And it was a two-minute walk from my home in Bangalore. It was a professional studio. And I thought, okay. Here we are in the midst of the worst time of COVID, but they were staying open and they had all the protocols. So we approached them. They said, sure, we'll give it a go. We did it. The final version, as you know, is five hours and 29 minutes uh, with some surprises in there. I brought in some guests. There's even a bit of, you might notice, a musical interlude here and there. We kind of, uh, we, we, we played with this model of audiobook. I had some fun with it. But anyway, I went to that studio 12 times. It took about 50 hours of recording, 
re-recording, editing, and so on. It was finally done. And I was humbled on a few levels, but one thing I discovered, you don't just show up and read the book and it's recorded. There's a few things. Voice training is required. Your voice begins to crack after a certain amount of time and then you're done for the day. So I had a sound engineer in the other room who was constantly in my ear saying, ah, Paul, can you stop? You need to go back and re-record that paragraph. You kind of mispronounced that one word or something. Amazing experience, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. No, I didn't know all that because I was wondering about the book that I want to write someday, mm -hmm. and I know it has to go on to audio. The children's books that I have, I haven't yet. I'm thinking about it, and I would probably have someone else do that anyway. Depending on the book, it may right. be better to have a narrator, yeah, uh, right. but absolutely, it's it's a great experience, and, and yeah, anyone who's written a book, I recommend considering an audio book. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, yeah, just one more thing. Okay. I was attacked the other day. Coincidence, I don't know, but... I bumped into two people that I you know, know well, randomly in TAC, at two different times, and they both said exactly the same thing to me, with their earphones in. Hey, Paul, I was just listening to your audiobook when I was up in the gym. A few minutes later, I was coming around the corner, getting a coffee. Hey, Paul, love your audiobook. So it's amazing huh? that it I is. think there's a bit of, let's say, uh, evidence that, that audiobooks are becoming more and more popular. They people. Must People listen to them while they're working out, while they're walking, while they're driving. So I'm starting to get interested in myself in audio. Now, you can share with us, because even though I have the audio book, the essence of your book. Mm -hmm. What are the, some of the key words or thoughts yeah. that, someone, that you put into it that you want to make sure everyone understands? The book is called The E5 Movement. So even within the title, you see there's something. There's five E's, right, of leadership. But also movement is a key word. I absolutely believe that exceptional leaders, whether you're, you know, we're talking about business, sports, politics, education, it doesn't matter the arena. Exceptional leaders create movements. They trigger movements. They influence action, which leads to movements. They create movements, right? And so that's why the E5 movement. Um, it's a formula of sorts, but you know, it's not a one size fits all. Fits all. We all have our version of leadership. It's my my personal version, and it's five E's. It's actually built on the back of other leadership models that have been out there. You know, Isaac Newton said, we see further when we stand on the shoulders of those who walked before us, stand on the shoulders of giants, right? So, uh, Konosuke Matsushita talked a lot about empathy. There's one E. That was core of his message. Fast forward to Jack Welch, you know, he had his ABC player, he had his three E's. Bob McDonald from P&G had his own version of the five E's as well. And there were others. So I, I crafted my version based on my experience, built off the back of other leadership models. The first E is envision. Create a vision which is rooted in the why, not the what, not the how, not the when, not the outcome. The why, purpose. We've been reminded of the importance of purpose, especially in the past few years with COVID and right? this new world. Start with the why. Great quote from Jim Rohn, the author. When the why is clear, the how is easy. Get the why right. Start your day with why. Okay, the vision is clear. It's compelling. Next, express. And we're in a new world. Even what you're doing now, Lance, with this podcast, this is the omni-channel. The way we communicate now as leaders is very different than, let's say, back in the day. It's important to employ and engage all channels to connect with people. So that's the express element. Make sure you're using all the channels you have to connect with people and get that message into their minds and into their hearts. When you do that, the third E comes, excite. People literally start to lean in and they want to be part of it. They're raising their hand. How can I be part of this? They have ideas. When the excitement starts to come, it leads to a moment of truth. And that's the fourth E, enable. Leader as enabler. And I think that's where I'm at in my own leadership journey. Create an environment where your people can shine, where they can take risks, they can experiment, they can be the best true version of themselves. Enable. And then, by the way, sometimes enable means getting out of the way too, as a leader. Let them be, let them fall, let them destroy. And then the final E, and this is true whether it's sports, politics, um, business, military, the final E, the ultimate measurement until the end of time will be execute. Execution. Bringing that vision to life for measurable impact. And so that's the model I talk about, but I frame it in stories. I promised myself when I wrote the book I would not have any algorithms. There would be no uh, nine box charts. 
It would be based on stories, not theory, but based in real stories supported by that. And then, largely from my own journey, but also I refer to everyone from the Beatles to Gandhi to, again, Matsushita to the Japanese women's soccer team, Nadeshko, to the Toronto Maple Leafs hockey team and their coach and everything that happened there. So a lot of stories uh, that come together that support the world. Before I end the podcast, I have a question to ask all of my guests. If you could go back in time and talk to the 20-year-old Paul, what, would you, what advice would you give him? Great question. I'd love to go back and talk to that guy. Uh, first of all, I'd say buckle up. Buckle up and enjoy the ride, which I think I've done, but I wouldn't even, uh, you know, fuel that. And secondly, I would say, ask for advice every step of the way. Because it took me a long time to figure out that when you ask for advice, you get stronger. It's not a sign of weakness. But when, you know, when you're younger, if I look at my 20-something-year-old self, I knew everything. I could do it myself. It was my, my mindset, my attitude. But at this stage in life, I have to say, I'm probably asking for advice several times a day. For people I trust and respect. We just get stronger when we ask for advice and support. So that would be the one. Buckle up and ask for advice every step. Fantastic. Thank you so much for taking this time. Thank you. Really, really enjoyed it. it. And well, then, I really like what you do. Thank you. Thank you. It's because of guests like you that I enjoy doing this. That's for sure. I want to thank all of you for watching this podcast. Make sure you press like and subscribe. And remember, it's all on loan, so reach for the stars because you're too blessed to be stressed.